technical problem. So hello to everyone. Thank you once again for coming. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Athena. I'm the project manager at Croy AI. And I wish I actually welcome you to the first uh, Croy AI meetup this year. Of course, uh, Ms. Love will have to say something at the beginning. So I invite Ms. Love, the president of Croy AI, uh, to say something about Croy AI. Croy AI means. Take a lot of time. I just want to say what um, what will be the main goals for Cray AI this year. So last two years, it was mostly about um, let's show that we can actually get a community, that we can actually uh, do like great pro projects that uh, people will accept it, that they like the idea, that we can actually bring, uh, bridge that gap between uh, politicians. Uh, journalists, scientists, and entrepreneurs. And this year it will be more about meetups, parties, and these kind of things, because I think we all miss that a lot. And I think that that idea that we presented uh, during our Christmas party, that we want to gather like 300 people in Croatia for really entrepreneurial spirit, want to share ideas, want to do projects together and so on. So now the idea for this year is actually just organize enough events to bring these people at the same place so that they can actually talk, discuss and start projects. And um, that, that's basically our main focus. So I, that's all for me today. And you'll get from Martina, you'll get the plan for the next three months. And you also get like how you can actually use Croy AI to tell the public about what you're doing, what kind of uh, invitations or what kind of uh, people would you like to meet and so on. So it's all about meeting, uh, sharing ideas and so on. So today I'm super happy that we have uh, this panel. I was thinking like, should I also discuss about this because I saw, uh, I like this uh, topic so much, but then I was like, no, no, that would be just too geeky. <laughs> and so I'm super happy that Millie will actually uh, uh, do the panel together with Steven. And yeah, let's just enjoy it. And please, please ask great questions so that we can actually show that this community is not only about listening, it's really about asking, it's about like testing ideas, hypotheses, and so on. So the official part is here, and then later we'll just move downstairs to the to the coffee shop, and then I think even better things will happen there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lily Dolan, and with me today here is Stephen Fleming. Uh, we uh, are very happy to have uh, a foreigner in Zagreb during COVID. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, Stephen is here accompanying his wife Helen. Helen, there you are. Uh, Helen is a deputy head of mission at the British Embassy uh, here in Zagreb. So uh, thank you both for coming. <laughs> um, Stephen, you wrote a book. Is this your first book? Kind of, yes. It's the first book for a general audience. So I wrote it. How many pages does it have? <laughs> that is a good question. It seems like a test. <laughs> Enough, enough pages. Where are you? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> enough pages. Um, yeah, so I wrote a book for an academic audience on metacognition, and then I did some science writing for places like Scientific American and New Scientist when I was a postdoc in New York. And when I was there, I got in touch with a literary agent on the back of writing those articles who suggested that I wrote. Was I interested in writing a book for a more general audience? And it's actually something I've always wanted to do alongside my scientific life, as you call it. Because the way I got into studying psychology was as a teenager reading books, I guess a bit like this one, popular science books on the mind. And like what? what? What was the book that you read and you were like, wow, I need to? Explore this. So there were two actually. There's one which I still highly recommend uh, called 
How the Mind Works by Stephen Pinker. Stephen Pinker is a psychologist at Harvard. And the other one was a book, um, I think just called Consciousness by, um, forgetting her first name now, Carter is her second name. And this was just all about the philosophy of mind and the hard problem of consciousness. Why, the, why should just mere information processing in the brain produce anything like subjective experience? Um, it's obviously a very old philosophical problem and this book was suggesting that we now might have the tools using brain imaging and so on to start actually getting scientific answers to that question. So, so those two books that I read when I was 17 that persuaded me to, that psychology was a real topic and I could go and study it. And so do you remember when you, it was the summertime when you were like, what am I going to read? I'll read this. Or were you, one, you know, were you a, 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 an anxious teenager and you were like, I need to understand girls. And how can I, you know, what was the motivation? What was the, yeah. the source? I'm not sure. Yeah, I still haven't achieved success with that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I, I think it, it was more... Um, I actually remember reading these books when I was commuting to a job I had after high school. I didn't know what I wanted to do at <laughs> university. And so I got an office job in the town in the north of England where I grew up. And when I was commuting back and forth on the train to that job, I was reading books on the mind. And that's, yeah, sparked an interest and one that I've never really lost. And here you are today. Yeah, yeah that's right. No, yeah, very glad to be here. Nice to meet you. So the book is called Know Thyself, The Science of Self-Awareness. Tell me a little bit about that. What, what does, first of all, what is self-awareness and what is the science of self-awareness? Sure. So self-awareness, we can define as the capacity that we have as humans to be consciously aware of what's happening in our minds, um, our personalities, our skills, abilities. And it's something that people have been fascinated about for thousands of years. So you go back to say Plato and they're talking about how self-knowledge, knowing what we know, knowing what we don't know is a key component of wisdom. And then you kind of trace it through um, philosophy and people are talking about self-awareness as being this uniquely human trait but it's only recently probably in the past 50 years or so that we've had the tools to start quantifying self-awareness in the lab in the psychology lab and that's a field of study that psychologists call metacognition or thinking about thinking and metacognition in a nutshell is the brain's ability to monitor itself. And probably the best way of introducing what metacognition is is with some concrete examples. So imagine you're revising for an exam and you're thinking to yourself, do I know this topic well enough or not? Can I stop studying and go do somewhere else? So that's a meta judgment about your memory. Have I got enough knowledge? Um, and in a completely different domain, so say in the domain of perception, you might be um, asked when you go to the optician for an eye test, they might say to you, are you seeing things clearly? And so that's not a judgment about the outside world. It's not, it's not that the outside world is blurry or in focus. It's your perceptual system that is blurry or in focus. And so you're making a meta judgment about how your mind is working, how your brain is working. Where is it physically how? Like where is it? Is it in an area of the brain? What's, can you describe to us the process of thinking about thinking? Yeah, so in, it's got different components to all, well, so I guess the, the short answer is we don't yet know, and this is in a sense what the main focus of my lab in London is working on the neuroscience of self-awareness. And in the book, in the first half of the book, I outline different components or building blocks that we think are important for metacognition. So one of them is the capacity to track uncertainty. And we think now that 
the one thing the human brain is really good at is dealing with uncertainty. And so often unconsciously, our perceptual systems, in order to solve these inverse problems, so you've got, in the case of vision, for instance, this is pretty well understood. So you have a fairly impoverished input on the retina, it's just a 2D sheet of cells. And yet from that impoverished 2D input, the brain is building this model of the world. And so it's resolving uncertainty at all different scales of spatial scales, scales of um, representation, there's uncertainty at all those levels, and the brain is somehow resolving that. And the interesting thing is that by computing with uncertainty, by using uncertainty as part of the conversation, you gain metacognition for free, because by estimating uncertainty in order to perceive, you can then also doubt what you perceive, so you get this kind of capacity for self-doubt for free. But this is a quite... Right. Yes, exactly. Um, but this we think is quite a low level form of metacognition that is shared with lots of different animals and it's not unique to human. And we think that humans above that have what we call explicit self-awareness. And this is this more heavy duty conscious capacity to think about ourselves. And what we're learning from our studies in the lab is that that actually might have a specific basis in the brain. And it seems to particularly involve the prefrontal cortex, so right towards the front of the brain. It's particularly well expanded in humans compared to other animals, and it's involved in higher cognitive functions. And in our study, so to give you a flavor of the kind of work we've done on this, so we can precisely measure how good your metacognition is on simple tasks. And the way we do that is by asking you to rate your performance, rate how confident you feel about your performance in different tasks. And then we measure the, the association, the statistical link between whether you got the answer right or wrong and how confident you felt. And so intuitively, if I'm the kind of person who is highly confident when I'm right, but not confident when I'm wrong, then that's an example of good metacognition. And we find that people who have better metacognition have a particular profile of structure and function of regions of the prefrontal cortex towards the front of the brain. Um, and so we think that that is forming part of the circuit that is important for human self awareness. And so, so, you know, there are humans who are more confident and humans who are less confident. Is that linked to self awareness in some way? Yeah, so we think that, um, we think that in terms of these models, so a lot of what we do in the lab is build computational models of. Um, of the, the parameters governing your metacognitive judgments. And we think there are two important parameters for people's metacognition. One is the sensitivity you have to performance. So that's what I was just describing there about if you have good metacognitive sensitivity, then you'll tend to, on a moment to moment basis, be able to recognize when you're right or wrong. And that is independent of the overall level of confidence you have as a person. So you could actually be quite a confident person overall, but have good sensitivity to your errors. You can recognize when you might be wrong. What um, about people who are who feel like they are always right and so, who are overconfident? Right. So so there, so there you get a collision, I guess, of bias and sensitivity where if you're just always confident and always think you're right, then by definition you're also going to have poor sensitivity. You're going to have poor self-awareness. And there are definitely people like that. And we've done some studies showing that people who have those features that you just described tend to be more just generally dogmatic and rigid in their views of the world. They tend to be the ones who adopt more extremist ideologies mm -hmm. and so on. So yeah, we definitely think that that's a key component of medical mission. That could be a title of your next book, Overconfident Politicians. Yeah. And how self-aware they are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. But what about people who are less self-confident, who doubt themselves mm -hmm. more? You know, is there is there room for improvement, or is this something that is sort of part of our genetic code and or part of our early childhood development? Yeah. So we think that um, it's certainly not set in stone. Um, like a lot of things, like a lot of aspects of higher cognition 
the brain is plastic. We know that we can improve in various ways. Any learning we do is existence proof that the brain can change. Um, and the fact that we are self-aware is also an existence proof that there is a system, the human brain, that has algorithms for self-awareness and that those can be shaped by experience and feedback. And so there's two ways that you can look at this. One is looking at how self-awareness changes in childhood. And it seems to be remarkably late in coming online. Mm -hmm. So the kind of early stuff that I was mentioning that is shared with animals, like sensitivity to uncertainty, monitoring our errors, that seems to be emerges very early in life after only a few months, um, maybe even earlier. But the capacity to explicitly doubt that you know the right answer or explicitly realize you might have been wrong about something. In the lab, that has not been shown to come into fully formed states until the age of around three or four. And what's really interesting about that is that that's exactly the same age where kids start passing these tests and thinking about other minds. And so there's this idea that's kind, of, kind of getting more traction in our field that explicit self-awareness might share the machinery for thinking about other people. So in a sense, the reason it might have evolved in the first place might have been that we got this capacity to think deeply about other minds and we, in a sense, applied those same tools to ourselves. Uh, we were talking earlier about children. Is there something, uh, you know, and there's always so much talk about early childhood development. Is there, it could, could it sort of, you know, now it's very popular to talk about mindfulness and kids just, you know, being more self-aware in that regard. But is, is this something that we could encourage in them? And in what way? You know, could you sort of teach your child to be more self-aware, to question their surroundings, mm -hmm. to sort of think about others, or is this, or, or, or is it too early in their mental development to expect that? Well, I think there's an increased focus on, in, in education, in more formal education in the classroom, teachers are getting more and more interested, as far as I can tell, in the idea of mental cognition, because in a sense, it provides this more general skill so if you can, and it's related um, to the notion in AI of learning to learn. Right? So if you can, in a sense, teach a kid to have the general skills of knowing when to stop learning and focus on something else, that's a metacognitive skill. It's not, it's not about maths or physics or English or anything else. It's just a general skill about how you approach your learning. And there definitely seems to be a... Um, a benefit for in educational settings of improving metacognition. So there seems to be this um, reciprocal uh, positive feedback cycle between metacognition and intelligence. So if you have good metacognition, that will help you learn, which will help you get more intelligent and so on. It's kind of virtual cycle. Okay, I was going to segue to my next topic, but I see Nislav already has his arm up. So. I would love to ask only one question. So. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of experiments with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I'm very interested to learn like what kind of experiments are you doing in your lab? You're mentioning uh, experiments with kids like ages three to four. Uh -huh. So how do these experiments look like? Like can you actually explain mm -hmm. about these experiments and what kind of things you can actually conclude from this? You mean on kids specifically? Or? We are kids, but it's like, no one does experiments on children. No, <laughs> well, these, these are your own kids, then you're allowed. <laughs> no, so I mean, so in my lab, we don't study um, children, but I have colleagues who run baby labs, child baby um, labs, baby labs. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, um, developmental psychology is uh, obviously a. Um, uh, well-established field and the kind of so maybe i'll tell you two two answers so one is about the kind of experiments that have been done on kids so one really interesting set of um experiments there is on theory of mind so the idea that we can measure your capacity to recognize that someone else might have a different view of the world to you so that's known as a false belief so i can recognize that you might not realize that I've hidden the chocolate, for instance. Mm -hmm. And you can precisely measure that 
in asking kids to watch these little scenes, uh, little cartoons that, in a sense, manipulate whether the characters in the cartoon have a false belief or don't have a false belief. And then you can ask them, what does Max think about where the chocolate is? Mm -hmm. And even though they might pass other tests, it's not until the age of three or four that they can start realizing that someone else might have a different view of the world to them. And that seems to go hand in hand with the capacity to realize that you yourself might have been wrong about something half an hour ago, for instance. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that developmental psychologists do. And then in terms of our lab, yeah, we, we um, tend to focus on um, studies involving very simple tasks, but that allow us to um, ask how does how do your confidence ratings about your performance vary over time? So for instance, we might get you to sit at a computer and flash stimuli on the computer that are very faint or that are degraded in some way and ask people to judge what they're seeing. And then after every judgment, rate how confident they feel. And we can do those kind of experiments inside the MRI scanner. Um, and we then measure online the blood oxygen level in different regions of the brain, and we can then relate the blood oxygen level, which is a proxy of neural activity, to their confidence on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So that's how we can start building up a picture of the brain networks involved in tracking uncertainty and reflecting on performance. So um, let's say that I'm very confident of my own levels of self-awareness. <laughs> and also, let's say, it's other people's self-awareness. But to what extent can we trust our own self-awareness? You know, mm -hmm. when you think, well, you know, I, I'm very self-aware of myself. I, I sort of, I, sort of, I'm looking at Mariana. I, I'm going to, based on some, some conclusions that my brain makes, I'm going to think, well, I know exactly how Mariana is feeling. But of course, I can't really know that because I'm not Mariana. Yeah. But, you know, so to, to what extent can we trust because you talk in your book, you talk about us being able to do maybe not scenario planning, but sort of um, calculating risks and choosing the best path that our brain tells us is sort of the, the, the least risky one or the most risky, depending on our personality. But so to what extent can we trust ourselves in making these judgments? Yeah, I mean, I think that's it's a really interesting question about to what extent do we have almost meta metacognition? which is in a sense what you're asking about there, which is like, we can measure your self-awareness. We can tell you what your score is on a particular test, but do we have a natural sense of ourselves as being a more or less self-aware person? And I think that it's, it's something that we don't really have as a good answer to. I, I think that a priori, there's a sense in which there's a paradox there that if we need self-awareness to know how self-aware we are, then if you don't have good self-awareness, you're not gonna know that you don't have good self-awareness. And psychologists have called this the Dunning-Kruger effect, where people who are poorly um, performing in a particular area don't have the skills they need to know that they're performing poorly in that area. Um, on the other hand, there does seem to be a sense in which, um, like we were just talking about, that you can train and improve your self-awareness with um, various interventions. So some of the things we worked on are actual training, giving you feedback on your confidence in different domains. But other people have done studies of mindfulness meditation, and they're doing, they're, it, it, there's early days for that work. There's only two or three published papers on this, but it does seem to have a benefit for these objective measures of metaphor bullshit. And so I think a lot of us have this sense of, yeah, maybe I need to do that to get a bit more reflective. Because this um, is how we make decisions. Right. You know, you right. sort of you 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 sort of you think ahead and you calculate the risks and then you choose one route, right? And I, I say this because in your book uh, about um, you talk also of you talk about of course self awareness in humans, but you also talk about machines mm -hmm. and sort of where we're headed as a society and uh, and all the new technologies that are coming, including artificial intelligence. And in a Financial Times article that I read about your book, 
uh, you say that um, uh, AI systems can sometimes be overconfident. Um, you're quoting, I think, your colleagues from okay. Oxford. Oxford. Yeah. Um, so, but isn't that the problem? Isn't and you, you you sort of point this, you list this as a problem. You know that an AI system can be overconfident, and then we trust the AI system, and we make conclusions and decisions based on this. But isn't doesn't this same problem apply to humans? Aren't we also overconfident sometimes? Mm. Yeah. No. I, I, so there's a lot there. So maybe we should um, just take the first part first. That's okay. So so talking about machines and um, well, uh, algorithms for confidence, right? So I think this is this is something we're getting interested in in collaboration with colleagues at University of Oxford at their Robotics Institute. That we've recently got a um, grant from the UK government to work on, um, in a sense, building metacognition into building minimal forms of metacognition into autonomous robots. And right. so, they call it computing with probabilities, right? Yes, yeah. So, so it's really this idea that why is metacognition useful in humans? So one reason is that it can help us guide ourselves, right? control our own learning and so on. Another reason is that it helps us collaborate with others. So I can say to you, hang on, I'm not so sure about this. Maybe you should give it a go. And we're really natural in uh, doing that kind of collaborative work. And the, there seems to be a um, real challenge there in terms of when I talk to my colleagues in robotics about there are lots of really um, amazing, obviously, advances in machine learning, but there's a sense in which do we really trust them to tell us when they don't know the answer? And so this is obviously a well-studied problem in AI that when you're giving a neural network um, out of distribution data, then it can be often overconfident about decisions on out of distribution data. And there's a lot of clever work going on about trying to extract uncertainty estimates out of those kind of algorithms. And what we're interested in doing is seeing whether we can, in a sense, bring to the table some of what we know from studying human metacognition. Because as I said before, the human brain is an existence proof that there are, there must be algorithms that we can study for self-awareness. So can we learn anything about that? And in a sense, put it back in to um, the machines. So what does now, that look like? Yeah, so lots of different ways of going about it. I think one, um, I mean, one promising route is in a sense, um, if you have uncertainty estimates from different subsystems, so say you've got a robot and it's you know got various sensors and it might have uncertainty about different sensors, we know that the humans are good at combining uncertainty across different perception systems to come up with an integrated model of the world. And then we're good at also, generally speaking, communicate to others about how uncertain our, our models are. Now, is there a way of kind of taking some insights from that architecture and porting them over into AI? So this is where I now kind of start to um, go way out of my lane because I'm not a AI researcher, I'm not a robotics. I was going to say, watch what you say, yeah, 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 we yeah, are yeah. in the room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But the, the idea is really to kind of, um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of trying to see whether not so much the how you get uncertainty out of machine learning algorithm, because there's plenty of amazing research on doing just that. It's more like what signals might you want to provide to the human user or human collaborator. And we know from human metacognition research that being able to naturally share confidence is, seems to be really important. Um, yes, Mitla. <laughs> um, so maybe just uh, let's not talk maybe then about the machines in that aspect because I have like strong opinions there. But let's say an average human. Mm -hmm. So it would be say that an average human really is aware of like where I'm like where I can be confident that I actually know what I'm doing, where I'm not. 
because we can see, like I would say, a lot of phenomena that where people will just be collectively disillusion, uh, delusional about certain topics. Yeah. We all live in information bubbles. Like humans are super vulnerable to actually. So we, we can actually use AI to attack them to create like the whole sense of real reality around them. So my, my question is like, is it an algorithm that we have here or maybe some humans are actually just uh, lucky enough that they ended up in, like, in a configuration mm -hmm. where maybe they can actually say that they're not vulnerable to that. So I think it's probably a bit of both, right? So I think, I mean, one reason we have to believe that there are, if not, algorithm is probably the wrong word, but some kind of dedicated machinery for reflecting on and thinking about ourselves is that we know from um, work with patients who have damage to these regions of prefrontal cortex and some work, I mean, we've done these studies as well, where you, in a sense, first do the brain imaging studies to figure out the key regions that seem to be involved in self-reflection. If you then study people who have damage to that circuit, you can find cases where people might be totally fine at, say, a memory task, but they're really bad at reflecting on whether they know what they know and know what they don't. And so in that sense, there does seem to be a reality to some sort of machinery that we don't understand in full, but there does seem to be some concrete reality to some machinery for self-awareness um, on a neural level. But clearly that's also getting shaped by our social environment. Um, and people's confidence about various things is also getting shaped by the collective. Um, but I think the reasons that I think the reasons that we have overconfidence about certain things are very different to the reasons that say a neural network have confidence and confidence about some things. So I think the, because I think that a lot of the overconfidence in, that's been studied in human psychology has been um, a product of inductive biases, we come to the table with priors over our probability of being correct. And so it might look like a failure, but actually it's perhaps uh, something that's optimized under um, the constraints of like bounded rationality to actually solve the problem in the real world. And it just looks like in, these, in the psychology lab that we're irrationally overconfident. Same thing for visual illusions. Like, would you want your machine vision system to have visual illusions? Like some people say, well, no, that would be silly because mm -hmm. it would be perceiving the wrong thing. But then a lot of what seem to be illusions in human psychology, you can then explain them as actually phase optimal solutions to vision. And so maybe you do want your machine vision system to be suffering from illusion. So I would think it's exactly the same issue, but now I've moved up to the higher level of confidence and self-awareness. So, sorry, Amelia. If anyone else has a question, <laughs> yes, please, please, please do go for it. Please do. So I, what, what happens to me very often is like my company is building digital beings. So not replicating humans, but let's say building digital beings. And very often it can seem like a magic. Like at first, oh, you say, oh, it's like magic. How does that work? And so on. But if you're an engineer working on it, and if you know exactly how it works, you just say, ah, it's actually an algorithm. That's basically not the real AI. Yeah, it's learning something here, but it's not real AI, and so on and so on. So if we would be able like, to open a uh, human brain in a, in a way to so actually be able uh, really to scan what's going on there, would, would we be really amazed? Wow, it's so incredible. Or we would be a little bit disappointed. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a, it's a cool question. It's like, what does it do to our self-image if we succeed? Um, and I think that, so now we're, I think, moving slightly towards the territory of consciousness in general, not just self-awareness, but conscious experience. It does seem a bit like magic. That's kind of been the source of this philosopher's heart problem that, why should just a lump of biological material produce this magical subjective experience? And my bet on that is that it probably will 
start to feel a little bit less magical, but not in any reason I hope that we threaten our self image. And the reason I think, the reason I, that would be my guess, this is very speculative, but like the, the analogy I think is, that is useful here is with the science of life. So 150 years ago, people were ha having scientific conferences saying, what is the magic of life? This Elon Vital, this, this kind of additional sparkly thing you had to add to inanimate matter to get it to live. And then eventually you had Darwin, you had genetics, and now we're like, yeah, we're fairly comfortable. Maybe there's still a deep mystery about what, how it evolved in the first place, but, but in terms of like the magic of life, we're all a bit less worried about it, I guess, and amazed by it. We're still amazed by it in a, the sense of biology is amazing, but in the sense of like, where's the magic? So biologists don't sit around wondering about the magic anymore. Whereas I think in the science of consciousness and self-awareness, there is a sense of like, we sit around worrying about the magic. And a lot of my colleagues worry about the magic a lot. <laughs> and I kind of feel maybe a little bit like the grumpy person sitting there going, I don't think we should be worried about the magic because if we just make progress on the mechanism, it will end up being like life. And we'll still be amazed at the mechanism, but we won't be worrying about this like secret thing we've lost. I don't know whether that is helpful. So you have to be amazed. I have to go with you on it, on it because I mean, the, I'm speaking from a Jungian perspective. Uh, if you have a really complex system and you figure out how it works, that's the magic in itself. Yeah, itself. Right. You right. don't need anything, anything else. Yeah. So in your case, if you figure out all the algorithms and you really figure out the bugs and things, so you can actually fix them and you can master a whole system and then you go and master another system. If, I mean, that system itself, it didn't lose the magic. You just have the, to gain the knowledge and how to understand and control. Yeah. Absolutely. I really like your job. Any other? Yeah, go ahead. I'm just letting my head down to remind me. Can you tell us, and then um, maybe it's further in the questions you asked from the previous person, can you tell us more about the brain connection? Uh, we witnessed in the last decade tremendous advance in how we visualize neural networks in our brain. That's something magical, really. Like mm -hmm. see how it looks. That's, that's really beautiful. And like, where are we now in 2022? Mm -hmm. uh, what can we measure? Mm -hmm. you know, if, if I, for example, chat you know, like it's a great means meet here, can we measure like which um, neural neurons in my brain stimulate Or like, how far we can go with this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. The connector is you're asking about. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, there are amazing developments on mainly in animal models. So the capacity to visualize um, the precise connections from neuron to neuron in cortex in say the mouse is phenomenal. I mean, you now have automated mm -hmm. systems for effectively slicing. I mean, the Allen brain. Institute in California is doing amazing work on this. They host it all online so you can just go and see it. You can fly through the mouse brain on the, in the browser. It's really cool. So you can, they, they slice, automate, they have an automated system that they slice and then reconstruct in 3D the connections between neurons in a cortical circuit. And um, the same is being done by Henry Markram in um, in the Blue Brain Project, uh, which is controversial because it sucked in a lot of EU funding, but their goal has been to, in a sense, do exactly what you say, like map the connections between all the neurons in the cortex. Um, so that's certainly becoming very possible. In the human brain, it's harder because you can't invasively do that, but you can um, use MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, to if you change the settings on the scanner, you can get images of the diffusivity of water through the cortex. And that gives you a very fine-grained picture of connections from A to B. So you get these beautiful images, you've probably seen them, like bands of white matter tracks in the brain. And that seems to vary from person to person and predict things like personality and cognitive performance and so on. 
So that's all cool. And the only caveat I would say is that I'm not so sure that that's going to help us understand how the brain works, right? So I think it's going to help us predict things like disease. So if you take a very high resolution image of the connectome and feed it into um, a machine learning algorithm to predict whether you're going to get dementia, you may well succeed with that. But it, you won't necessarily understand why you're having the symptoms of dementia. And I think to have that kind of understanding we're going to have to build this bridge between psychology and the neural measures. And to do that, we're going to need computational models um, in the middle. We're going to need to understand, comes back to the discussion about the algorithm, we're going to need to understand something about how the brain is doing what it's doing. And to be honest, we don't know. Apart from a very small amount, like there's some amazing work on reinforcement learning in the brain. That's it. And, and there's some really cool work on um, visual processing. But in terms of the computations that the human brain is doing, we have very little understanding. We have a question over here. Steven, if you're using super computer technology in your work, and if you did, what was your experience with that? So I'm afraid I'm going to have to say, we, we, no, we didn't. So it's, um, yeah, we, some of the work I was just referring to in the answers to the previous question, so this is colleagues of mine who do process very high resolution data. The reconstructions there are pretty heavy duty, but the kind of work we do, you can do the analysis on a laptop. Um, so yeah, we don't really engage with that. Yeah, I think that you partially answered it, but so how, how much we as a society uh, or, or science know about human brain really? Because if, if you want to imitate something and create an intelligent machine, you first need to know, you know the, the basic how everything works. So without that, it's going to be super, it's super difficult to create something intelligent, general AI or something like that. So, how far did we came, you know, uh, in history and now? And do you think that we can have some progress uh, soon about that? Well, I think making predictions is not a good game to play because, <laughs> I mean, it, like, it's always dangerous. But um, I think there's this story about Ernest Rutherford gave a lecture in London in the 1930s saying there wasn't going to be nuclear fission and the next day someone picked up the newspaper, read the story and invented nuclear fission, I can't remember his name, but he said it wasn't going to be happening for 50 years. So I think that making predictions about the scale of intelligence is fraught and I, so I think one thing that is useful to say on this is that I actually think conscious experience and self-awareness and I talk about this a bit in the book, is orthogonal to intelligence. Like you can be smart and unself-aware and have no conscious experience. You can be not very smart and be very aware. Um, so I think these things come apart. Um, but in terms of intelligence itself, I guess your question is hinting at, do we need to first understand the brain in order to get to human intelligence? And I don't really see why, why we do actually. I think you guys are doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> Because like, the same, like you don't need to, you build a plane to fly, you don't need to necessarily know how the bird flaps its wings to get something to fly. Yeah, but usually a lot of progress in, in airline uh, and the plane are done by, you know, copying from the, from the nature. Yeah. Is it? So, I, I, I don't know. So, yeah, because I don't know, they added like we'll additional needs, you know, because they were watching out the bird. So, so you can certainly probably get lots of insights. And I know um, in London, for instance, we have a lot of, uh, interactions with DeepMind um, and the guys there, because there is a lot of crossover from neuroscience to um, basic AI research and back. And I think that's partly because people are interested in the same problems, but I think that um, there's, there's quite a lot to be learned about in terms of inspiration. So you can say, well, the human brain has a, in the, a memory system that seems to be independent of like the perceptual system. Maybe that's a useful division to have. In, you know, so there could be a lot of inspiration to take, but I don't necessarily see that one has to come before the other. It doesn't feel like that's necessary. That's just my guess. 
Anya. Going back to the previous question about children and uh, self awareness, yeah. uh, I admit I don't experiment with my children, but I did make my baby to myself to be experimented oh, on. Cool. She has a full Well done. <laughs> 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 she, she, she got a new TV. But um, so, what I was wondering, you mentioned that it is basically partly nature and partly nurture, right? Um, and you mentioned that it does develop very early in childhood. Uh, could you comment on whether there is a, a societal effect on the mm -hmm. type of child that you have in it? There any evidence in that being a massive effect on your self awareness that mm -hmm. you're not kind of predisposing you for more or less? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I think maybe one clarification is that there are the things that develop early seem to be relatively low level. Um, the, the, the kind of experiments have been done, this is amazing work by colleagues of mine in Paris who have looked at signatures of self-monitoring in babies as young as uh, five or six months. And they also use EEG to, um, in a sense, get them to make eye movement to different parts of the screen. And then sometimes they'll make an eye movement where they expect um, uh, so there's a decision to make and they have to make an eye movement to the right or to the left. And if they make the wrong decision, then in adults, you will get something called the error related negativity, which is a pattern of EG response, which seems to be very related to us being aware of making an error. So if I hit the wrong button, then I'll get an ERM. And you seem to get that same signature in babies as young as six months old. So those kind of low level, Abilities for self monitoring seems to be in place early in life. <clears throat> but then there's a disconnect between that and um, the emergence of this more explicit, reflective self awareness that seems to come later in life around the age of three, basically. Um, but and this is me just stalling the time because I don't, we don't know, <laughs> is the answer. Um, no. Social environment, which you know, the people have noticed in the field that has an effect on. You know, being I don't know, being on a lower level of self awareness, you know, yeah. more potential to develop the Yeah, I, I think it's a plausible hypothesis, but no one, to my knowledge, has tested that. Okay. Um, there has been work on like your childhood experiences, trauma, and so on, on things like emotional reactivity. And you could easily imagine a similar study being done, and it would be very interesting to do on, on metacognition, on self awareness, but I don't know of anyone who's done that. Um, can you maybe try to put that in the context of evolution? So we like share a lot of like uh, DNA with other species. Mm -hmm. So what would you say? When can we actually start talking about consciousness and self care <laughs> at that level? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think one um, one thing we know now, I think that we didn't know, say, fifty years ago, is that these building blocks for metacognition, the capacity to track uncertainty, to estimate a sense of confidence, to monitor for errors, they seem to be relatively widely shared in mammals. Um, so there's been some really cool work translating the human confidence tasks and making animal versions of them. So you can train rats to um, make an initial decision about whether they think there's uh, which are two different smells you presented to them. And then you can train them to hold the lever longer when they feel more confident about the choice. And if they do so, then they'll get a, um, a bigger reward. And so the really nice thing about that is you can then use a task like that to show that in the rodent brain, there is a representation of confidence in its decision in the prefrontal, or maybe not in the frontal cortex anyway, of the rodent brain, debate about whether rodents actually have a prefrontal cortex or not. But the bigger picture of that is that, yeah, there seems to be widespread 
um, in many animals that have been tested seem to pass these tests of mental cognition. What we think is more human unique is um, the social aspect, the ability to think about other minds. And even chimpanzees, who are the closest relative to humans, don't fully pass these tests of theory of mind yet. I mean, there's loads of cool work trying to devise tests that they might be able to pass. But so far, it seems to be that humans are at least outliers in terms of being able to think about the minds of others and, as a consequence, also be able to think about their own minds. Um, and so there's an interesting then relationship between that and what might be unique about the human brain, evolutionarily speaking. And <clears throat> what seems to be particularly well expanded is um, the regions of cortex that are important for building hierarchical models, the highest levels of the hierarchical model of the world and ourselves. Those parts of the cortex seem to be particularly well expanded in humans. And so there's, that's about as far as we can go with the science, but then we can start to speculate about why that might be. And one prominent idea, um, there's a, um, evolutionary neuroscientist, comparative neuroscientist called Susanna Hikulani Hutzel in South America. And she's done really nice work taking dead brains of lots of different species and putting them in a blender, literally putting them in a blender, blending them up and then- um, Drinking it. Did, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then um, counting the number of cells in, um, in each of the brains. And from that, you can then take look at the profile and see where the outlier is in this relationship between the size of different brain regions. And she speculated that maybe the one reason that this, um, these parts of cortex is particularly well expanded is that when humans started living in social groups, they had to start keeping track of like, not only where the food is, but also what does Mislot know? What does Millie know? What, all this kind of like social information. And as soon as I have to start building that kind of model, Maybe, and this is really speculative, maybe then I can start thinking about myself in a, in a similar way. Yeah, one, one of my favorite experiments that I do at home. Um, <laughs> it's also very practical. It's actually <laughs> very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually like uh, how to teach a child actually that, for example, mom exists even if you don't see, see her. And that's something that you don't see like when, when they're like in worms. And that's something that's very practical, by the way. If you, for example, <laughs> uh, don't want to carry your child all the time so that it's not crying and so on, you basically need to teach a child that even if you, your mom is not holding you or, you or even if you don't see your mom, she still exists right. and you're still safe. And so you can actually, like, uh, people can do it like uh, accidentally or it can just happen, or you can just do the experiments and trainings. <laughs> What's the secret? I mean, we really actually need to train <laughs> to, to, to know this. Well, the separation of practice. Practice. Hi. 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 Hi.
certain associations and that can reveal the fact you might be biased against a particular race or and so on. But the idea, as your question suggests, is that we're not necessarily aware of carrying those biases around. Um, and I mean, this is not um, an area that I'm so uh, expert in, but my understanding of that literature is that um, it's been really hard to design ways of getting people to become more aware, just naturally aware of those unconscious biases. And in a sense, like the depressing answer is that that's not that surprising, given what we know about how self-awareness works, which is that in a sense, we need to, that information already needs to be in the conscious workspace in order to allow us to reflect on it. Um, and so I guess the, the, the only way I can see that happening is in, if there was some way of um, naturally cueing people, I guess, to, to become aware of those implicit associations. And it seems really hard because the only way you can do it is getting people to do these tests and then giving them their scores. But that's not a natural way of cueing people that those associations are getting triggered. So, um, yeah, I, it's a super interesting problem. Yeah, but no one has to be ourselves myself and this out of there actually should open some questions and that if we upgrade the notion rate <laughs> so maybe we will get some answers to that. Yeah so maybe maybe then um and this would be a hypothesis that one could test is that maybe by improving metacognition on a more general level do we then get more insight into the biases that are driving our behavior that's a hypothesis that could be tested. Yeah. We, yeah. We have a brand. We are here today in artificial intelligence society, and the most of artificial intelligence algorithms, which are coming uh, from human behavior, when we observe human behavior, whatever, are biased. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, because I think that uh, uh, at this point, it is very important to, uh, to be aware of it and to. Uh, uh, to implement the, the objective methods of measurement and creating the not measurement, creating the algorithm to uh, evade the biases because it is uh, it's dangerous. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, also some lawyers are here for very interesting this creation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know, there are people that are here. I don't know if there's a lot of touch that point no yeah not so much but i am aware it's also a problem but not something that i'm an expert on yes i'm interested like did you do any work with uh, how emotions are connected to that transmission mm. and how emotions influence the transmissions <coughs> and the second question is how how can emotions be implemented in some machine systems so that's the easy one. That second one. <laughs> um, so the first one I can certainly answer is that we have done some work. I think there is a, quite a growing body of literature on how emotional states, um, bodily states, interoceptive states, so what's happening in our bodies, our heart rates, and, and so on, how that subtly but pervasively biases are self-evaluations. Um, so there's some really nice work um, showing, for instance, that if you flash unconsciously an emotional face just before you have to evaluate your performance on a completely unrelated task, you, your confidence in that performance will get changed and modulated. So there seems to be tight connections between interoception or emotional states and metacognition. But that's a slightly different, um, so that, that, that those are the kind of interactions we can study. But then the other, I guess the other thing we can look at is how you become aware of the emotions themselves. And there's a very rich um, area of study in psychology of attention to emotion. Um, and so that's, we don't know whether that is another facet of metacognition or whether maybe it's just a lower level thing whether it's just being conscious of the emotion. Do you have to reflect on the emotion to experience it? Or can you just have this lower level 
emotional experience um, and there's differing opinions there and one of uh, my colleagues in that area a guy called Joe Ledoux who's written quite a lot of books on this topic thinks that one of the reasons that animal models for psychiatric disorders might have failed in many respects is that they miss out on this higher level aspect of reflective awareness of the emotional um, ship. So that's an interesting thing to think about. I, I don't, um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's just another aspect of what it might mean to have metacognition of emotion. Um, but in terms of your second question, yeah, how do you build emotion into a machine? I thought that's what you guys did. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm doing something on that topic. So I would say that, like, uh, in an ideal world, with infinite amount of resources, if you could actually rebuild the human, then you would have the emotions. But because humans are evolved, then you're just adding one component to the other component and so on. So you're not, like, uh, changing the, the foundation of DNA because then you just get something that's not functional. You're usually just adding layers, layers, layers. That's why we don't have uh, consciousness before we are having the like, in the last how many years and uh, the things with the emotions is that like if you don't have enough time to really put something on a conscious level and actually to conclude, conclude what would happen emotions are really good, a great approximation that can actually guide you how to make decisions mm -hmm. and then the idea is actually should we replicate that in machines or not like are replicate is it replicating emotions like really the ultimate goal of uh, ai or not that's more like what, for example, what uh, Jetva said, Jetva was like saying, oh, do we need to study brain in order like, to build something that's intelligent? But that's basically saying, oh, only humans are intelligent. But that, that's not the case. There are like different levels of intelligence. You have like in some animal species, we have an uh, intelligence that's basically built into, in hardware. They're not learning anything in the software part, everything's in hardware. So we as humans, huge portion of our intelligence is in software, but still a lot, and I, I would say like a huge part of the brain is basically just in charge of like running the body of the body, like knowing what's wrong with the body and making sure that like we can actually run. And there's like a small part of it that we can actually is focused on consciousness and like self-awareness and everything mm -hmm. else. Cool. Cool. But that, I mean, in, in a way, maybe then if you kind of take inspiration from the way emotions work in humans and you try and take those into a uh, machine context, maybe you wouldn't have to worry about the ethical consequences of that because in a sense you're missing out on, and you might not need to go to the level of consciousness, self-awareness and so on. You can still have all the functional benefits of emotional states without the subjective aspect, perhaps. Um, First hand, second hand. Mark. Yes. Hi, Marco. Uh, I mean, like this one, said, uh, I think it's basically fair to one huge experiment. <laughs> we're, we're participating in building a human being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's a never ending story. So, uh, all those little experiments that Missile said is just like phase one, B, A, one. Yeah. And my question is basically related to the connection between empathy and self awareness, or better yet, between uh, person who is teaching another person something, does a person with higher empathy level can be considered a better teacher for some somebody else's self-awareness, whether it's a human being or a yuck. For example, if you use an engineer who has a high empathy level and task him to train an AI and being self-aware, would that create a better result than someone with low empathy? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean I think the I, I really like this question about teaching because I think there are really underappreciated reciprocal interactions between the act of teaching and our own understanding of what we know and don't know. And this makes sense from the point of view of if you think that part of what metacognition is, is the capacity to take the kind of machinery we use to think about other minds and turning on ourselves, then if we're put in a situation where I have to think, okay, what do you know about this topic so that I can teach you better, so I can pick the right thing to, to explain to you next, just the act of doing that 
seems to sharpen our understanding of what we know and don't know. And there's been some nice experimental work showing exactly that. Just, just getting people to teach can sharpen up their own metacognition about what we know and don't know. So that's slightly different to empathy. I think empathy depends on how you define empathy, but empathy could be at a lower level, just at the more, um, I guess, un understanding what someone else is going through is more about empathy. And whereas I think the benefits of teaching for self-awareness and vice versa come from this higher level of, in a sense, being forced to think about what the other person knows and, and the benefits that can have for your own understanding of something. And um, I've certainly found that in, in the university, in the academic context, like often there's a sense in which researchers should protect their own time and try and avoid teaching. And there's this definite sense in the UK that you try and like get out of teaching as much as you can. But I think as long as it doesn't overwhelm you, teaching is, I've always found it to be really mutually beneficial for the research because you're forced to explain to someone, then you understand better what you don't know about. Yes, sir. My name is Michael Degas. First of all, I want to thank Mr. for inviting me. This is really a great talk and uh, quite interesting uh, questions from the audience. I have one question. Perhaps it is off topic, but you mentioned uh, animals. Now we have a question regarding plants. Do they feel, can they feel emotions, pain even, or are they self aware? I'm asking this uh, because I'm a carnivore and I have friends who are vegetarians. They say they will not eat meat because it hurts animals. But do uh, plants feel pain? So you Sorry right. for all the question, but this is unique for the human class of the person who is Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I'm worried you're just trying to get fuel for your argument. Your <laughs> um, I mean, so there's a sense in which um, there's, we, we come to the table as neuroscientists with, I guess, very strong priors about what systems can and cannot do. Um, and so one more boring answer is no, because they don't have a nervous system and they can't use the, they can't move around and you need a brain and a nervous system to act and plan and guide behavior and so on. And so plants in, in lacking that, the idea would be no, we don't have a machinery that a brain would have to feel pain. Um, on the other hand, if you take a more kind of information processing view of what a brain is doing, then that could be substrate independent. You could, and I think that's why there's so much um, interest slash concern about what would be the consequence of us succeeding in building something artificially conscious, almost by accident perhaps, because it's substrate, in theory, it could be substrate independent. So in that sense, you could like theorize that if that's the case, then a plant could have some information processing that would be conscious in some way. I don't think that's the case because I think that um, consciousness is related to the kind of representations a system can entertain, and those representations are about its own processing. So, when my view, my personal view of how consciousness works is that it is a more higher order process. And I don't see, even in a substrate independent system like plant, I don't see how it could engage in those kind of representations. So I would say no, but I wouldn't want to say totally rule it out. You're such a professor. But, <laughs> <all these nuance. laughs> but, but I, would, I would rule it out to the degree to which I would be totally happy with continuing to eat plants as well. <laughs> Um, so, are, are there any other questions? Yeah, maybe gentlemen, gentlemen at the back. Well, as and we are um, ready to um, express complex questions. So, one complex question for you. At the beginning of this century, theory of complex systems stated magic number 10 up to 10. Which is number of uh, atoms in uh, most elementary uh, and elementary uh, living being on Earth, 
has potential for self-organization. We now have already 10 up to 10 computers in time. So we have any kind of potential for self-organization. And other statement is that the human brain has also 10 up to 10 neurons and their potential for self awareness Is this magical number still useful or we have some other ones? Interesting, yeah. I, I, I mean, I guess, so your question is like, if you get enough, it's um, about complexity. Sure. If you get no element, we need to make self Right. I, I see. Self yeah. So I think, yeah. So your average human brain has about eight to six billion neurons, give or take. And that certainly seems to be sufficient for the majority of us to enjoy self awareness, conscious experience. Then the question becomes like, is it just about sheer capacity? Sheer scale. And I think this is where there are divergent opinions. Like, can you, and this is, it goes back to the question about connectomics that we had before, where some neuroscientists think the best approach is to, in a sense, start with figuring out the connections between individual cells. And once you start doing that, you just scale, you just keep scaling it up to the whole brain and create a simulation of that, and you're done, and you, you've got it. And my, and that's been controversial because on the other side of the, side, on the, of the um, argument are people that say that's not going to create understanding and it's probably not even going to create replication because we can simulate weather systems very well. This is the difference between reality and simulation. You can simulate a weather system, it doesn't get wet inside the supercomputer. The same thing, you can simulate in theory interaction between all those eight to six billion neurons, it wouldn't necessarily give you anything functional like um, the brain. So I think that's where you need constraints from theory, um, from models. Um, and so I think just wiring up 10 to 10 units of processing, is not going to give you, in my guess, anything like consciousness or subjective experience. But I, I have colleagues who would totally disagree. So. <laughs> Is much more uh, important than uh, single unit production. Well, I would say computation, what the computations that it, the system is doing is more important than how it's implemented. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Stephen, however, will be available downstairs. <laughs> um, uh, I'll just sort of try and wrap up now and say, uh, so is it a self-help book? No. <laughs> That's the question we all want no, to No, no, you won't learn anything useful. No, you won't know, I mean, the, I guess the argument I make at the very end of the book is that this is not going to give you any tools to become more self-aware. It's not necessarily going to change your life in that respect. But what I think is hopefully more subtle and longer lasting is the idea that if you understand a bit more about how the system works, then you gain what I call meta metacognition. You gain metacognition about how self-awareness works, and that hopefully helps you understand why it might go wrong or fail in various ways. Uh, and what do you have your next book in mind? Like, what's the next thing you will be working on? The meta meta cognition, or what can we expect from the lab? I'm lucky at Helen here because I started writing this like after about a, a month before our son was born, and so that wasn't great timing. <laughs> but, like, uh, yeah, so I think I'm gonna have to wait a few years. <laughs> but, like, um, no, I mean, in the, the thing we're excited about in the lab at the moment do have more and more work on uh, the computational um, underpinnings of consciousness, um, in particular, the capacity to become aware of our mental states. Will um, that be a self-help book? And so, <laughs> and so that could be the next book about theories of consciousness. And in a sense, like I see consciousness science um, as being in a similar place as theories of quantum physics, like there's loads of different competing interpretations of what it means. There's loads of theories out there. It's an exciting time. We don't have any answers, 
but there's so many different perspectives that in say 50 years time i think we'll be in a place where we can start to say right now we can actually do some science because at the moment it's just all theoretical speculation so i want to write a book outlining that theoretical debate and see where it might take us well we're very excited about the sequel so <laughs> uh cool. Stephen, thank you so much um <laughs>
we had a we had a use case recently. So uh, some of these projects will um, so the EU will grant you the money. Uh, they will basically pay you for the cycles. Mm -hmm. So there's that uh, that option. The other option is if you're doing the research. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's a pure research, then you can gain uh, access. Uh, it, it, in theory, you can gain access in, uh, on our resource, um, and there's a case that you can gain the access on Euro HPC resources uh, without paying for it. Uh, but unfortunately, right right now, uh, uh, we haven't onboarded anybody on our Euro HPC resources because they came online just like a month or two ago. So there's still a really complicated process to get on top of it. That's so, so why I'm asking because I'm just trying to make it very simple for our members. So, like you're saying, oh, there's like some resources that the that government, like or like success, sorry, uh, can can you actually use them or not? So like, uh, or uh, we should just uh, tell people story that there it exists, but it's it, for someone else. And so, so or how we can actually if we actually uh, make call to people and uh, call people like if you have needs, please call them here. Like you will get that thing. Uh, well, I hope they will. <laughs> but I mean, it also depends on the cases. So not everything can be on board at the HPC. The, the HPC has specific. Um, so there are rules of the game. How you uh, run your application. So it's not like uh, Amazon Cloud where you get the interactivity. So the HPC has uh, uh, some limitations. So saying that in one percent of the cases, if somebody comes along, they'll get something for free. I, I can't. Uh, I can't really promise that, but um, there are a lot of options, and we can help you. Well, at least at least try to get on it. Um, if you are doing uh, one of the Erie projects, so if you have a collaboration with any of the of the universities, uh, I can tell you for certain for certain that you can get on our uh, on our resource uh, uh, free of charge. So that's the recipe. Like start working with the university. Yeah, and that is, and also get some. Yeah, the HPC is I'll just say it like that. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, but that's it's our case. But, but uh, the partners in the uh, they have yeah they have some other case. Uh -huh. So uh, that's why it would be cool if you if you need HPC come to us. There, it's not only me. I'm uh -huh. I'm mainly for the academia and the research community. Uh, I don't have that much experience with startups, to be honest. I, I'm honest now, <laughs> uh, but we do have experience with uh, onboarding people who are collaborating with the universities. That wouldn't be a problem. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the specs of the resources you provide? Uh, our resources right now are not, uh, well, I mean, we acquired them two or three years ago. So, right now, for the AI community, I would assume that the GPUs are um, more uh, interesting. So, we have 12 uh, we, uh, we 100s, and by the end of the year, we will have uh, around 100 A 100s. NVIDIA's, we don't still, I'm sorry for everybody who's not technical, uh, we don't still have the AMD's ones, the M200, uh, we didn't go for them because the uh, the stack around them is still not uh, well developed like the NVIDIA ones. Um, so that's what you get, what you can get in our case, uh, if you own our infrastructure and the Euro HPC, it really depends because they have uh, five beta scale systems and two exascale systems. And, most of them, except for the Lumi in uh, in the Scandinavian countries, they all have NVIDIA's, and uh, the Lumi is the only one who got the M two hundred. And uh, CPU like CPU like resources. Uh, CPU like resources. In our case, it's three thousand CPU cores. We'll have uh, six thousand. No, we'll have around twenty thousand by the end of the year. Uh, right now, everything is on Intel, and since the AMD uh, did a really really big push. Everything will be AMD by the end of the year. The, the whatever it will, uh, uh, they, they're doing the Sapphire Rapid, Rapids architecture, but it's it's too late already. Uh, the AMD, it, it's everywhere. All the pretty much, I think none of the Euro HPC was 600 petaflops that they offer, they're all on the AMD CPU resources. And then if you need if you need the, the storage, then we have different. So the GPUs would usually go with the MDD uh, and MDMI SSDs. Uh, we usually try to put a lot of RAM inside it, like 300, uh, between 300 and 1 terabyte per box. Okay. 
sorry for talking <laughs> over. So basically, some of us will actually come to you and they should do the product discovery. No, so we don't. Just no, no. <laughs> we're, uh, we are really near, we're nearby. We just got ourselves a new building, which is another campus. So there is a really nice uh, Mensa <laughs> with free, with not free, cheap food. Um, yeah, that, that, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you all for coming, and that's it for today. And let's see you downstairs. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>